look much as a high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. July 20th, 1969. The world watches spellbound as men walk on the moon. But even as the space age reaches its zenith, the information age is launched. Three months after Apollo 11, on the campus of UCLA, the greatest communications revolution in history is born. Like the space race, this revolution has its origins in the Cold War. America is stunned in 1957 when the Soviet satellite Sputnik circles the globe. A man-made celestial body for the first time in history overcame terrestrial gravity and flew into space. Not since Pearl Harbor have Americans been so shaken by a foreign threat. Many fear a nuclear assault from space. Round and round the globe at 18,000 miles an hour, bleep bleeping to Moscow and the world. Apparent proof that Russia could deliver an H-bomb at long range by rocket. We go back to 1957 when the Russians launched Sputnik and caught the United States with its pants down. Then President Eisenhower said, this is unacceptable. We have fallen behind in science, engineering, and technology. I shall propose a program of action. Eisenhower creates ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Housed within the Defense Department, ARPA spends lavishly to spur scientific breakthroughs. We basically created this ARPA and provided funding so they could support civilian uses of technology just to increase our capability. Every time they went to a new researcher, the researcher would say, you want to fund me? Fine, buy me a computer. And the said, happily, we'll buy you a computer. And the researcher would say, not only do I want a computer, I want the capability that everybody else has. Give me graphics, give me high performance, give me database, give me artificial intelligence, etc." Computer technology, a major feature in modern life, was... But not even ARPA can afford to provide the latest hardware and software to every researcher. The solution? They need a way to share computing resources. Enter UCLA professor Leonard Kleinrock. His graduate work analyzed the flow of data through a computer network. The interesting thing is that we were able to set up a mathematical theory of data networks long before the network was implemented and designed. We understood how it should and would work. The concepts lie fallow for a while. I kept improving them, publishing papers. Nobody cared until Sputnik created ARPA, ARPA created the computer group. The computer group, IPTO, deployed sites that became specialized and needed to be connected. The Cold War runs rampant with fear and paranoia. The threat of nuclear Armageddon fuels a culture of secrecy. a place for fear. Remarkably, ARPA understands that There's science operates on a different model. The best results come from trust and collaboration. ARPA would come to a researcher, a trusted researcher, someone they had confidence in, and say, here's a pile of money. Reach beyond your grasp. Go for the high risk, high payoff. If you fail, it's okay. Don't fail all the time. But it's okay to fail. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. So the culture, the way ARPA presented their funding philosophy, was one of open, shared, flexibility, trust. Now, when that kind of money came to principal investigators like myself, what did I do with the money? Well, I had an army of graduate students, of a software team, a hardware team. I'd go to them and say, look, here's the kind of thing I'd like you to end up with. Here's funding, go do it. 
ARPA researchers draw inspiration from advances like computer time sharing. Computers of the 1950s process the work of one user at a time. By the mid-1960s, multiple terminals are connected to each mainframe computer, allowing it to run numerous jobs simultaneously. Why not use that same idea for time-sharing communications resources? If we're sending data and we stop sending it, let somebody else use that same link. Time-sharing of communications resources. That was another aha moment. Engineer Paul Barron takes the concept a step further. He devises a way for American officials to maintain communications in the aftermath of a nuclear attack. He tried to design a network very much along the lines I was thinking of, which allowed messages to go hop, hop, hop across the network without dedicated paths, and such that in my design and his, if any node got broken or any link got destroyed, the network would still function. Barron's system contains no centralized switching station. It operates even if many of its links are destroyed. And he develops the concept of dividing messages into packets, small bits of data that move separately along the best available route, then rejoin at the destination. This interface message processor, or IMP, ignites a global revolution. In October 1969, Kleinrock's team transmits from UCLA to a matching imp 400 miles away at Stanford. We were in the room here, and all you have to do to log in to the SRI host is type L-O-G. And each time you type a character, it gets echoed back to your terminal. And once you get to the G, the SRI machine knows enough to say, oh, somebody's trying to log in it types the IN field. So all we have to do is type L-O-G. Fine. Charlie typed the L, yes, but you get the L? Yep, got the L. Type the O, you get the O? Yep, got the O. Type the G, you get G. Crash. The network went down. So, the first message ever on the internet was low, as in, lo and behold. Now you have to understand, we didn't have a camera, we didn't have a voice recorder, at best, we have a little entry in a log saying we did this. Alexander Graham Bell was a smarter man. He, he had a message ready. Come here, Watson, I need you. Uh, Samuel Morse for Telegraph, what hath God wrought? Armstrong, giant leap for mankind. Those guys were smart. They understood PR and public relations and media. We had no such message. On the other hand, the message we ended up with, which was L-O, low, is perhaps the most prophetic, most powerful, most succinct message you can imagine. And it was the first message of the internet, and that happened in late October from here. In fact, it was October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 at night. And there's the physical four square feet where the imp was sitting, the package which was sitting. Now, how many revolutions do you know where you can say the exact minute it started and the exact four square feet where it began. <laughs> 